Ladies and gentlemen, I am Saku Mantere, Professor of Strategy and Organization, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the second installment in the Integrated Management Symposium Series, organized by the Marcel Vesatel Institute of Integrated Management here at McGill. McKinsey & Company has been around for 90 years now, am I correct, 90 years, helping clients, senior executives, navigate such complex and uncertain environments. And we are fortunate this evening to welcome Mr. Dominic Barton, the Global Managing Director of McKinsey, as our guest. Um, in his illustrious career, the most recent uh, step has been the chairmanship of Prime Minister Trudeau's Economic Growth Council. Our discussant this evening will be our own Professor Chris Reagan, who also um, serves in that same, same council, Economic Growth Council. He's well known, for instance, for his work uh, in the Eco-Fiscal Commission, where Mr. Barton serves as an advisor. The Eco-Fiscal Commission is using the tools of economics in finding ways to balance economic prosperity with sustainability. There will be a Q&A after the discussion. Now, without any further ado, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Mr. Dominic Barton and Professor Chris Reagan. Thank you, Seku, and thank you, uh, thank you for having Dominic come, and thank you for asking me to uh, pepper him with questions. Um, I will try to be the polar bear to his walrus, <laughs> and I I'm hope I'm not good. dead at the end. <laughs> um, okay, so we, we have divided the conversation tonight um, into five sections, and integrity uh, floats through all of the sections. So uh, let's start with McKinsey and integrity. So McKinsey is arguably uh, the world's leading management consulting firm. Its success over decades, 90 years you've just heard, presumably reflects not just the analytical skills of, of your people, but also something about the way you behave, something about their integrity. So can you begin by telling us what integrity means to you and to McKinsey and how it how it enters into you know, the day-to-day -day business life? Sure. I, well, first of all, it's wonderful to, to be here. This is the uh, first time I'm embarrassed to say I've been here, though I have to say there are so many people around the world that I meet who are from McGill in leadership roles. And I just, uh, so I hope everyone here is proud of that. I just I literally see it everywhere around the world. It's an amazing diaspora, so it's wonderful to be here. Um, I would say at the, the essence of, of what we try and do is based on trust. I mean, you, if clients want you to help them do something, they have to trust you because often you, you, you may lead them into territory they haven't been into before or you're dealing with issues that they may be struggling with to, do, to, to deal with. Um, and so trust is at the core of that and that's where I think integrity comes in. So it's all the basics of you know, telling the truth, um, you know, all, all, all the basics. I think what what we try and make sure of is I think there's, a, there's two elements. One is it's client first. I think it's very important to be client first is it, because that means that whatever you do is in the interest of the client, not yourself. And, there, and, if, and I think that may seem like a very basic thing to say, but I think a lot of organizations have got themselves into difficulty when they mix up client first versus firm first, if you will. And it's, uh, so that's a very important element, I think, of it, client first. And then there's a set of values that you have, again, which is built around the, the basics of integrity, which I think help you perform as an institution. You know, we're not a religious organization, so we don't have values because it's a good thing to do. They, the values are there because they help us do what we want to do. And so we have uh, about 15 different values. I won't go through all of them, but, you know, there's one, we've talked about this before, that I really feel strong about, which is the obligation to dissent. You know, you're not only do you have the right to disagree or say I think someone's not correct, you, you must, it's an obligation, the words are picked very carefully. 
And that's important if you want to be a meritocracy, which is an element of what we are. It's about ideas matter, not your seniority. So, so that's an element that we think is very important. And, and what we do is that no matter what your experience level is, no matter where you come from, if you think something isn't right or you, you have right. an idea, that it, you must call it out. So and can you give us an example from when you were in the trenches as a, as a, as a younger yeah, consultant it, about it, where you had to well, disagree? Look, David James will get me, keep me honest on this one. But I, 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 one of my first projects was, out, was in Calgary. And I remember I, I'd been, it was my first two weeks in the role, and the, the project manager was trying to lay out an approach for how we were trying to help turn around a bus company, wasn't it? And, and he laid out an approach, and he basically was taking what we'd done in the U.S. for, a, for the U.S. subsidiary of the company. And it seemed like we were just copying what that was. It didn't seem to me the basics of what I'd learned in my first course at McKinsey, which is you go to the fundamentals and you build it up. You don't do that. And I was just getting uncomfortable. And this, this guy was busy, right? He had so many different projects going on. And so in that case, I, I said, I don't think we're doing this right. And I'd only been two weeks in there. And so this project manager got quite irritated and said, you know, let me, you've been here for two weeks and you don't think I'm, and I've been here for three years. I mean, you really say that? I said, no, I, I was taught that we're supposed to do it from fundamentals. And he says, well, how about I'm going to teach you something else, which is you should listen to your elders. I remember this and I was going, okay, <laughs> I got the picture. Um, and uh, about a day later, the partner came. He flew in from Canada, Stuart Searle was his name. And he looked at the work we were doing and he said, this is completely wrong. We shouldn't be doing this. And why didn't you say something? So it was a very awkward situation because I didn't know whether I should say I did say something and he didn't think it, you know, it was one of those. And luckily the project manager said, well, actually he did, but I told him to shut up basically because we had to get the work done. And that was a, you know what I mean? And he goes, well, that's what we, that's your, you know, and that was a, I've never forgotten that, right? And it's been, and I've had that happen to me, where you know, even in my role now, I was in, uh, I was having a meeting. I remember this; it was in Germany, and we were about to see a client, and it was a big merger situation. And I laid out; I was very busy. I'd flown in. We, here's what we're going to say, and how is it going to work? And I had a, there was a, a, a six-week associate that said that that pr approach is simply not going to work, in a very blunt way. And I said, you don't understand. I know this guy. This is what he likes to do, and he said that's simply not going to work. You can't go in and say that. And then it, he, it just made me smile because he was doing right. the... So someone obviously taught him well in that place. <laughs> that, yeah. So yeah. as you know, I've been... So McKinsey has an internal mini MBA program and I've been teaching in that program for about 15 years. And um, which is my only kind of entree into the world of management consulting. But when I teach these courses and you talk to McKinsey consultants who are there as, as tutors, you hear a lot about these firm values. Mm -hmm. um, is it, I mean, it, and it sounds like it's a distinguishing characteristic of McKinsey. So is it, is it? I mean, or, or do all management consulting companies I, have, these, I I mean, have these values that they take very, very seriously? I think people do. I think if you're in the trust business, if I could call it that, we don't even like to use that word, right. but if you're in the trust profession, you. You have to. I mean, there's a book. We have a lot of uh, nasty books written about us, which, we, which we, again, we probably deserve. But one I would recommend looking at is well, we'll one We'll come by, back to that. The, you deserve yeah. that? Okay, no, well, yeah. I'll just write that down. Char Charlie Ellis has written What It Takes, and he's looked at uh, five different, in a sense, professional firms. So he's got, you know, the Capital Group, uh, the Mayo Clinic, uh, McKinsey. He still includes Anderson in there from before. Before it went, he believes it had. And it's really... It's not only, it's, I don't think it's, see, it's about the values, it's how you, how inculcated they are. How, so one of the things he talks about is recruiting, because you see in these firms, we, we do an endless approach. I'm, I know that we're lucky to have some people we've recruited here, you know it's a pretty, it's a quite a brutally long process. We have, there's at least, you know, 20 people that are getting a chance to look, and most people say that's just too much, why don't you do three and you know whether they're in. Well, we, we think that's really important because you, you get a sense of what someone's like and then how that decision is made is all part of the process. So the execution of it is fundamental, how you evaluate people. It's a, we, we spend piles of time in evaluating people and a lot of that's around behaviors, values, how they, are they client first, how do they treat team members, do they, you know, there's, and, and so that's execution I think is the 
the key. And I'm, I, don't, I say this not sounding like we're some sort of church because we've had some pretty big uh, failures uh, on it too. So you spend a pile of time evaluating people, but you also spend a pile of time training people. So yeah. the mini MBA in which I teach is one of, I don't know, dozens yeah. of internal courses. So is that, I mean, how does that, how much of that is about integrity and, and about trust and about earning client well, trust? You should or, tell me on the mini, I haven't been to the mini MBA well, for a well, while, I'll tell you, so I don't in, know. In yeah. the mini MBA, I'll tell you yeah. that where it comes up. So yeah. we have this case, we have five case studies, and one of them is called, it's a fictional case study, it's called Kazakhstan Motors. And the basic story, <laughs> it's a great one. And it's, it's a, yeah, we probably have to change it out of yeah. political correctness now. Yeah. But, um, but it's, uh, it's basically, it's a car company, um, you're trying to fix their, their situation, but what comes in in the end of the case is if you donate to the local, to a political party and they win in an election, then they will give you tariff protection or something. So it basically comes down to an expected value computation and basically it's how much are you prepared to pay to do this support, right? right? And so we do go through the economic analysis and then we always save 15 minutes, which is a huge amount of time in a McKinsey mini MBA because there's just no time for anything because it's, it's yeah. solid work. But 15 minutes for a tutor led discussion about the ethics of the case. And then, and then it leads to a dinner time conversation yeah. about firm values and obligation yeah. to dissent and all this yeah. kind of stuff. Um, but that's where it comes in in mini MBA. I don't know yeah. where the integrity comes in um, in the other many programs. Well, it's in all, like we have a, pro, our new, for new people that join, everyone has to go through, we call it Embark, and it's a, basically a two-week program, too, where you're, you're taught, it's really the history of the firm and, and crossroads or forks in the road that we've had, and then people talking about tough situations. So that's very values intensive. Our, our engagement manager, when you first become a project manager, that's a two-week program, and that's, you're learning skills about it, but you're all, it's also, we, we try and we have, we usually have people who, we have clients come and talk about what they appreciated, what they don't like, what in, and, that, and that type of thing. So I think it is, it is a core part of it. Um, and then I do think the evaluation matters. I mean, you, that's where, you know, you, you reinforce it or not and how you, how people move ahead. Okay, so let's change the topic slightly and talk about actually dealing with the clients and in their, in their client situations. Um, so when you're dealing with clients, and most of your clients are corporate clients, when you're dealing yep. with their competitive environment, are the problems that you're encountering, are they mostly kind of technical problems? Are they economic problems? Or are they people problems? I think they're actually all of the above because what, what we're dealing with now, I'd, I'd say the, the nature of our work has been changing significantly over the last three years. There's much more business model redesign going on now. You, in, and I'd argue that if you're a successful company, that's even more difficult to do because people say, why do we need to change? And so there's always a technical aspect, but a lot of it too is what orthodoxies do we have to challenge about ourselves? And that's you inevitably get into resistance. But people say, well, you better, you know, that even values, those, these are values that held us in good stead. Why would you ever challenge that? We do. And, and so all of that comes in. Probably the hardest thing to deal with is the, is the resistance. So that resistance, that, I mean, if, yeah. so if you've, got, if you've got a technical solution yeah. uh, to an economic problem, a business problem that is relatively straightforward, um, but it gets blocked. It yeah. gets blocked by personalities, institutional rigidities. So do your, do your um, consultants end up being experts in conflict resolution as much as they are experts in financial well, analysis? I, yeah, I mean, I think you ha it's human nature, right? About what, you know, there's a, um, you, you, there was a study I remember being involved in where I really learned that. We were working for uh, an oil company and we were putting in convenience stores. All right, this, I'm being so old in McKinsey, this was actually a new thing at the time, it hadn't been done. And um, we spent a year uh, doing the work, the strategy, the implementation. We, they literally, we redesigned, we literally build stores in gas stations. I, I pumped gas for four weeks as a gas to, to learn how it, so we, I was really deep in this and it was a, and this was a very Did large... Did it take four weeks to learn how to... Well, I was slow. I was, I was slow. Okay, I was okay. very slow. Just but you know, you learn in that, I have to say, I learned... And it was actually a bit embarrassing because you're not allowed to talk about our clients. And I had people from my university at UBC saying, hey, Dom, are you okay? Because I, I, we're not allowed to talk about our clients. I said, yep, this is my job. 
and they'd say, wow, okay, good, you know, I hope you're enjoying, I said, I'm happy, I'm doing this job, <laughs> and, uh, and it was, uh, but I, but it was really, because we were running this, um, a store, basically, right, to figure out how it would work, how many people would actually buy, we were trying to get, how could we give people, especially from Toronto, a breakfast in two minutes with a newspaper, and meanwhile get your tank filled with gas. That was sort of the offer, right? Because people were 75, I remember the 75% of people don't have breakfast when they go into work. They're hungry, they're ticked off because of the traffic. So that was the proposition we were doing. Anyhow, cut a long story short, we, this was a billion dollar EBITDA opportunity. It was a big opportunity. We were doing it with a client and it, the client wouldn't make the decision, right? And I was down and working in the retail part and they wouldn't agree. And I was going, are these guys, what the hell is the matter? I could, can't believe they wouldn't do this. And there was a partner named Sun Yen Se, who's one of my mentors, who took me aside and he said, you're the idiot. And I said, what are you talking about? These, it's a billion dollars and these morons won't do it. I mean, what's their problem? He goes, you are going to spend four weeks figuring out why they are not doing it. And what I found out in the process, these are all smart people. They don't, what I found out is okay, how do people actually make decisions in this organization? I didn't know that, right? So I figured, look, good idea, makes a lot of money. I'm working with the client. These people think it's good. I actually didn't know how people made decisions, right? How big decisions were made. And what I found out, again, to cut a long story short, was at the executive team level, the difference between oil prices being at $35 and $50 made this billion dollar opportunity chump change. It just was nothing. And so what was, it, we weren't in the scheme of things to sort of build a whole new capability. It was kind of like, that's interesting, but a billion's not that exciting to us, actually. And so it, by continuing to say it's a billion one or a billion one and a half, it does, wouldn't make a difference. And so I think it's the, the, there's a book that I highly recommend. It was actually written by someone who had a different firm. I can't even remember the name. He worked with us, Alan Cantrow. It's called The Constraints of Corporate Tradition by Alan Cantrow. It's my favorite book because it actually talks about before you do any work in an organization, you should understand their culture and what they do and why they do it because they're smart people that do maybe sometimes things that you think are crazy. So spend the time uh, to do it. So that's- Smart people who do things that you think are crazy. Have you yep. ever like consulted for a university to find out? <laughs> that's the, that I'm is pretty the, sure there's smart that's people the high, here I, and I'm pretty sure I, there's I some I think crazy that's the highest level. Done. That's why I have a lot of respect for the, the dean. I was, I was saying, you know, to <laughs> you, I, I sometimes think making change happen in a partnership is difficult. I think universities are a whole different level of It's a whole of different that. world. So, yeah. um, okay, so one of the things that must be true about a global and a highly successful management consulting firm is that you end up consulting for two different clients who are competitors yeah. in an industry. So you have Toyota and Ford, or you have Nike and Reebok. What do you, what do, you do? I mean, you, you, you could obviously get into some problems there. So how do yeah. you, if that happens, and I assume it does, yeah. how do you prevent the obvious conflicts from happening there? Well, we, we, do, we, do, we have a policy that we do work with uh, competitors. And so what we do is you just have to have very strict processes. Probably the most intensely strict processes are I've experienced in Korea. You know, we, you know, working with, you know, these people literally would, you know, they get almost violence with each other. So if you work with, you know, your Samsung and LG, that's a difficult thing. See, there we have to have people basically in different buildings, different servers, different, you know, you, you can't, you have to be, the, the Chinese walls notion is a, are iron walls, if you will. How long people are allowed to work, how you share information, what's allowed to, you know, um, you, where, what resources you access to be able to do things. So it's, uh, it's obviously, it's very serious because you, you know, that's again the trust issue uh, that comes in. And I've, I've exp you, know, some t you know, I'd have to say that my biggest issues, I get a lot every week, there's people that are, you know, gonna be upset or complaining about things. And often those are on conflicts because even with that, sometimes clients will say, I can't believe you work with a competitor. That, it's just the philosophy, actually. And there's, Bain used to have a philosophy if they only worked with what we're not gonna, but they changed that. I mean, because you, you can't develop expertise in an area if you're only doing that, but you have to be extremely, rigid and strict in terms of how you manage it or you're in tr you'll 
Real. So I'm a macroeconomist. One of the things that I always that struck me as being very cool about McKinsey, and there are many things that are very cool, um, but is the McKinsey Global Institute, yeah, right, which is basically a macro think tank, more yeah. or less, within McKinsey, where they often bring together this micro industry yeah. dead data yeah. from competing firms, yeah. and they put it together into studies. So, yeah. so here, you're, so for some parts of what you're doing, you're keeping this data separate, yeah. Yeah. and for other parts. You bring you can, it together. Yeah, to and we have to do be. Global studies. I mean, this is where we could all talk about data. We were talking about with some of the students before. I think the, you know, data analytics is such an important ch area and change in, w in what we're doing. But as you said, with the Global Institute, it actually started because one of our colleagues in California was l trying to figure out why, what's happening to productivity and what, what's technology's <laughs> impact on productivity. And we do the, a lot of co with the cost reduction, overhead cost reduction programs. And Dave, David James knows that he used to drive a lot of that work we were doing. And the, so if you imagine you've worked with 3,000 organizations where you've literally gone down to how much time does it take to fill this glass of water and how long did it take? So we have the micro view of organizations. And this guy basically took all that data and my analogy is he sort of swam in it. He just, you know, was look what he, and what he found was that more than 50% of costs in organizations are interaction costs, even in a mining company. It's telling someone what to do, where it is. So what tech, because people are trying to figure out what, so what technology does by shortening the times, by simplifying, by standardizing, has huge product, and that, we found that out by literally looking at that database. And that's where we said, okay, we we have a lot of data, and as long as it's clean, and we're not, you know, we're not comparing, you know, Shell versus Exxon, or, or you said Toyota, but you, you you're collecting a broad set of data. It's not a you can actually get that's that's the Global Institute really is much more to get macro views from micro insight, if you will. That, that, cool. That's the objective. Okay. Okay, I'm going to really change the topic now and, um, and go on to long-run capitalism. So you have, you have written a fair amount, actually, about the problems that capitalism faces in the long run. Um, one of your papers from the uh, Harvard Business Review is one that I give out to my students every year in a macro policy class and in a financial crisis class. It's a great paper. Um, and some of the stuff you've done on this is uh, with Mark Wiseman from yeah. CPPIB. Um, so I know that McKinsey consultants are trained to become expert in delivering a 30-second elevator pitch. So can you give, to CEOs typically, so can you give the audience your elevator pitch for what's wrong with capitalism? I don't, I don't know if this will cut it, but I'd say capitalism in the last 30 years has become much more short-term and exclusive than it was supposed to be. That, that basically is what I'd say. What do you mean by short term, and what do you mean by exclusive? Uh, the we're only to the sixth floor. floor sixth point. floor. Okay. Yes. Yeah, right. The by by short term, it, quarterly capitalism. Pe that a lot of uh, publicly listed companies, leadership teams, are obsessed with quarterly results versus the five to ten year performance of the organization. Uh, and by exclusive, what I mean by that is being completely focused on shareholder value at the cost of any of the other dimensions, health, the, the talent pool, the innovation, sustainability, um, uh, trust, because you you got to deliver results. And I'm, I'm, I'm being black yeah. and white, but that's the essence of it. Okay, so let's actually, um, let's think about some of the solutions to that. So. There's a lot of literature that suggests that privately held firms, mm -hmm. as opposed to publicly traded ones, are better able to, because they don't have to have those, those AGMs and the quarterly results, they are much better placed to take a long run view. Yeah. Um, but of course, one of the beauties of the public, publicly traded corporation is that it has access, ready access, to financial capital in yeah. large, large volumes. Um, so if you have the privately held firms and you get the benefits of the long run view, how do you at the same time get the access to the capital yeah. that, that they need? Well, just on, you know, one thing I'd say is in the last three years, we we're seeing a higher proportion of privately held firms over a billion dollars than publicly listed, if you will. So people, I think there's been a shift toward private uh, for some of the reasons you're mentioning. I think what's different now is that there is access, you can get private 
long-term capital. Pension funds are much more comfortable now than they were before in providing, you know, a billion or two billion dollars to a private company. You, you, you could, those, those can be arranged. The ability to raise private capital, the family offices uh, that have been established with, with literally hundreds of billions of dollars will back private companies. Um, so, so I think the access to capital is less an issue. I, my own personal view of the ideal governance is a publicly held company with a long-term minority stakeholder. Um, because what, one of the other benefits of a publicly list, excuse me, listed company is you get a lot of people analyzing you, right? You get all these analysts. It's, it's a, I, wouldn't, I don't like the quarterly results and having to listen to analysts tell you what, you know, what your cross-sale ratios of hash browns were last week, why are they all that. But you get a lot of people analyze, you, you get a lot of information. And the question is just not to get sidetracked by what the short-termists are saying. And if so, if you have a, a, a long-term minority, that could be a pension fund right, or it could right. be a family. And that's why I'm also, some of my McKinsey colleagues really don't like me saying this. I'm, I don't mind having different dual shares. I think that's good governance too. I don't, I don't think there's anything wrong with that because it's the stability in, in the system. The dual share structure. The dual share well, structure. that's never an issue in Quebec. Yeah. Uh, hardly, <laughs> okay. hardly, yeah. okay. I can't think of the last okay. time that's yeah. come up. Yeah. Um, um, but if you have a long-term minority shareholder, mm -hmm. is that, an, I mean, don't you need some of the power I, of the control? Why well, not long-term 51%? Well, because I think it's, a, you know, the, again, you don't need, with, with uh, by minority, I'm sort of saying like 5 to 7%. Oh, so it's not 1%, right? But it's an, uh, 5 to 7%. You can, that has a lot of influence in the place when it's a, usually a very fragmented shareholder base in a publicly listed company. And so they can have quite some influence in, in where it is. And, and this gets, I mean, the extreme is voting rights, right, in terms of control. But I, I think it just provides a bit of backbone. If I, and, I, and I learned this, actually. If you look at Telefonica, when it changed to become a global champion way back, this it was a sleepy, backward Spanish company. All the images of old Spain this company had, just siestas, you know, worst productivity. You got a CEO that came in, one of the first things that he did was change the investor base from retail investors and found a couple of long-term investors, the capital group, and said, this is going to be a journey. It's going to be an ugly journey. It's not going to be nice straight lines. It's going to bounce around as we move through it. I need you to back me as we go through this. And he did, and that, and that changed it. Paul Pullman at Unilever was done, you know, when he came in and said, I'm going to I'm going to double the profit of this company, but half the carbon footprint. A lot of people said, what you, and I'm not doing quarterly guidance. And if you don't like that, sell my stock. And what he said about three weeks after that, he realized that it's easier to lose your shareholders <laughs> than, gain, than gain them. But it, it did change. And he got, he, it, it, the investor base changed. And so you've got people that will stick through so you can actually go through the ups and downs. And that's the part, and that's where I think family businesses, the successful ones, because one of the challenges, right, is not, I think it's only 3% of families go beyond the third, you know, you have to have a well-run right. right. family, but, but you get a family business and they're thinking generations, it, it gives, it's a strategic advantage. And, I, and that's what I saw in Asia. You saw people So for, for share ownership, yeah. um, fine, but how about governance? Do, I mean, yeah. are there, are there compensation schemes that we should be adjusting to take longer run view? Are there uh, uh, board governance composition issues? I, and this may relate to the health and trust and, yeah. and sustainability. Like what, what I, in I think order should a, we be doing on the governance? There's a whole range of, uh, I think, governance issues. And this is something that Mark Wiseman and I, when we were doing the work, uh, and also Larry Fink from BlackRock's involved too, is we were we figured at first it was the, you need more long-term shareholders, the pension funds, institutional investors to help keep management focused. Um, and I won't go through all the detail, but we tried to look at where in the value chain from the institutional investor to the asset manager, to the board, to the executive team, where's the problem, if you will, right? And the biggest problem was actually the board. Uh, the, if you ask CEOs where their biggest challenge was, it was boards being short-term. And part of it's because they're getting pressure from asset managers to say, you better, let's see some results, and they worry. And so I, I think with boards, there's a, a range of things. One is that you need boards on the metrics side to be thinking about health metrics, not just performance metrics. So looking at the quality of the talent pool, the innovation rate, the trust, 
the sustainability. And by the way, the pension funds care about your environmental footprint because they're going to own you for 60 years. So they actually maybe do just like they, they care what, what you do because it'll affect their returns. And so getting, most companies don't have that. It's easier to look at earnings per share. It's, we look at, we're much more, per, so changing that. The second is actually to spend time talking about strategy and long term. Most publicly traded companies spend very little time talking about long term. They talk a lot about risk and it's understandable given what happened in 2009, but a lot of it's on compliance and risk, not on where are we going. Where, I remember it was Jim Flaherty who, you not, who, who said, I always I was ask people you meet, what do you wish you'd learned at the beginning of your career that you now know? And I remember he said, you need to have a microscope in one eye and a telescope in the other and not get a headache, right? And I, I don't, I'm, of course that doesn't happen, but I, you get the picture. And he said, so in my view in business, that means having a three month view and a 20 year view at the same time. So you, and bo many boards are, have a microscope on as opposed to a telescope and that's, a problem, but do, so you mentioned the the uh, you know compliance issues, yeah. especially after the the global financial crisis. So do boards, do their concerns go through cycles? That you know they'll they'll worry about compliance for the next few years, and yeah. then they'll start thinking about longer term strategy, and then some other crisis will happen. Do they cycle through those kinds of things? Have you seen I, that? Well, I I, th I think there is some of that, but my sense is, in at least in the Anglo-Saxon world, in the last thirty years it's become more about the short term. I actually think, I don't think there's been so much of a long-term uh, perspective. I think now we have activists. I mean, there's the crisis, but the big issue right now is, what do you do if an activist comes in? That scares board members, because it, you know, you, if, you're, you, if you're a board member, it's off, you, know, you often like to be on other boards and do that, and you have a reputation, and you, it is not fun to have an activist that's there. And, that, and activists are more prevalent, they have more capital. Uh, that's available. They can now go after bigger beasts, if you will, and so that's a, that's what we're dealing with 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 right now. And you've got shorter CEO cycles that are. Uh, so what's happening. the solution to this, though? I mean, how well, how do you get the board to start I, taking a longer we, view? We, I think there's a number of things. One is to get is to have the institutional investors be have much more voice, and that's what you know Larry Fink is trying to do that with his letters that he sends to CEOs that says, "I want to see health metrics. I want it," and backing. Companies. So, if you think about uh, Dow, they, you know the institutional investors helped Dow deal with a very aggressive activist because they said, you know what, we're not going to vote for this stuff. We're, we we're here. We're, we're the biggest shareholder here. So you listen. You, we're not going to go with this stuff, right? You you back us. Um, G, and getting GIC in Singapore has a they have a you know they have a they have a five year, ten year, fifteen year performance set of results, and they say we want board members who think that way. So when you think about your board composition, think about who those people are. Um, and then, so, so I think board composition, to your point, also matters a lot. And I think some of the standard rules of governance that, by the way, McKinsey also puts in place are not that helpful sometimes. Like saying, you know, we need a board of, a diverse board of 15 people and we have to have an age limit of this. I, I don't buy that. I, I buy the diversity. I don't buy age limits. Sometimes having a 75 year old person on the board, if you're in a long cycle business, is a very good thing to have because they've seen the, they've seen the flow. Yeah. Um, you, if I think about some family uh, owned boards, Mars, if they, it would fail all traditional governance standards, they'd be at the bottom 100. So they have three people, right? It's family members, but they've, th their advisory group that they have, they're unbelievable. They're, it's very, you know, they've got someone who's one of the most knowledgeable people about children's health right, in, in, in what they're doing. They have one of the best experts in regulation in the food industry. You, you know, they've got very deep experts in what they think they need. And then it's professionally, you know, it's not, they don't, the family doesn't try and run it. They have very good um, succession and people planning processes with people. But it doesn't look like the standard, right. you know, good governance. And that's where I think we're getting too much into checklists and not, the fundamentals. It uh, seems like the only way, in your examples, the only way to get that better, uh, more forward-looking board is to have some institutional investor or some I, some large investor that, that can help back it. I, I do. I do think that's the case, and that that because the ultimate, I think the and that's where you know if you think about it, that's where a lot of the capital is is in, is actually long-term money. That the challenge is 
they often evaluate their asset managers, even though they're long term, on an annual basis. So even though the, they're long term, their asset managers are trying to get performance. And they worry. So there's a bit of, that's where the incentives are, are a bit out of whack, right, and where it is. And also we have some rules. I mean, I think this quarterly, the idea of quarterly guidance, I think is, uh, I, I would recommend if you are courageous enough right. not to do that. So, so if you look at um, what Mark Wiseman is doing at CPPIB or what Michael Sabia is doing yeah. at uh, the case, so they, they're investing a couple of hundred billion dollars each, right, give or take, yeah. you know, a bit. Um, are they looking for, for the most part, are they looking for investments where they are playing that role as a 2%, 5%, 10% investor so that they can actually it, enforce that long run view? I think there's a, they would like to, I think the challenge, and I don't speak on behalf of them, they should, but, but, but I think there's a notion of you, you, they're investing for 60 year period, right? That much, so they, it's in their interest, that's what they prefer, I think, to, to have. Now there's obviously liquidity, re so they have to have a portfolio and all of that. But I do think they look at it. The challenge is they don't have the capacity. They don't have very many people in CBPIP and and um, and the case. So you can't you, the, just given the scale of the investments, you can't go and spend time with each board. It's just too there's too much money, if you will. And so the challenge is how do you get your asset managers and the other people that you co-invest with to think that way? Do you know what I mean? So that they move move the system and that's why I think I think it's more about the influence they have on the asset management industry and actually on board so you see them a lot speaking to governance groups about this is what we like to see this is what we think is important and that that influences people and and again the fortunate thing in Canada we have uh, phenomenal pension funds I mean Ontario teachers the British I mean it's a and it's there it was a governance it was actually because of some very good governance that was done in separating out the, how they're managed versus who they're managing the money for, which allows them to be independent, long-term, hire the right talent. And so there is one thing in Canada, I don't think we understand it, of how well-respected mm -hmm. they are around the world. I was explaining to some people in a, in a discussion earlier today, I was in Kenya last week, and the president of Kenya was basically, they want investment, not just Chinese investment, they want long-term investment. <coughs> he didn't know I'm Canadian, he doesn't, he said, you know, what would be really helpful if you get one of those Canadian pension plans to come here because if they come, everyone else comes. So how, how could we get access to one of those people? It was an interesting. Cool. Yeah. Well, governance is close to government and that brings us to policy. So let's yeah. switch topics, in integrity and public policy. You and I are currently, so, so see that's, Pretty, that's the, okay, so there's. Ripped apart, ripped apart on the. That's the public servant that yeah, is being that's right. devoured. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so you and I are currently involved in two projects together, yeah. uh, Canada's Eco-Fiscal Commission, which I chair and you yeah. sit on the advisory board, um, and the Finance Minister's Growth Council, which you chair and I sit on, the, on, on as a regular guy, and so does Mark Wiseman and Michael Sabia. So let's talk about those things for a bit. Um, so this will absolutely sound like shameless advertising, but can you tell this audience what the Eco-Fiscal Commission is all about? why you wanted to sit on the board, uh, and how you think it's doing. I think it's a crap organization. I've never, <laughs> I've never seen anything. I've just never wasted so much time in my life before. I, no, it's honestly, it's fantastic. Because I think what it's doing is bringing, uh, serious, it's bringing, I think, economics into the environment. And it's, I think business needs to think uh, much more carefully about the impact that we have on the environment and price it into what we do. And I think the, environmentalists need to need to think more like business people in what they do and so a lot of it's around pricing uh, if I think about the you know what you you because you've played the key role in it have, have written on carbon uh, you know the, the we have to price carbon it's crazy that we don't price that given it's a cost and it why why isn't that included how we use incentives to deal with things like congestion uh, right, and, and I think about this all the time. In London, it took me yesterday. It took me two and a half hours to to, to drive 15 kilometers. Um, and you think about all the pollution, what it does to productivity, and we. So, so to me, that's what it, at least it means to me in my narrow. You may have a broader view of it, but that's all good. Yeah. Um, 
It is all about pricing, and it's amazing to me. So I'm, I've been here at McGill for 27 years, so I've been an economist for, I don't know, 30 years. And um, it's becoming more and more clear to me uh, the more and more I talk about eco-fiscal, whether it's to governments or business or just regular people, um, how, how different from normal human beings economists are. Um, probably different in many respects, but I mean, economists think about prices, and they don't think about prices the way just the way consumers and producers think about prices. So, as consumers, we go into a store, we think, "Well, that's pretty expensive for those shoes. This is pretty good price for that television." Um, so we do that, but but we see prices as a much bigger picture. Right? As, as a way that resources get allocated, as a thing that drives innovation, it really produces incentives. And most people don't think about prices that yeah. way. But at the heart of the Ecofiscal Commission is getting the prices right. Yeah. I mean, it's channeling Adam Smith, but it's also channeling Bob Barker right, yeah. to get the prices right. Yeah. Um, it is. It absolutely is. Um, so how does the mandate of the Ecofiscal Commission um, in your view, fit into your views about how capitalism needs to be, modif uh, needs to be modified? Well, it's very, I mean, it, totally, because it's long-term capitalism means if you're a long-term capitalist, you care deeply about the environment, not because it's a good thing or morally it's the right thing or you see a film about the polar bears not having it. You know, it's, it's, it's economics and you're not going to have, you, you got to think about your returns and it's a cost and I think a big problem right now is we're not reflecting that cost in our goods and, and <laughs> our activities. But we, we will, in, but for sure, in the next 10 years, it's going to be a factor. And so we have to factor that in. And that's why I think it, what is what's very interesting is to see, I think in the last three years in particular, business, maybe not as much as people would like to see it, I think have really grabbed hold of this. And even, I, I'm very excited actually in Canada in the energy sector. The number of people that are, for example, on the eco-fiscal committee that are energy companies that are actually talking about this. And it's not because of, um, because it's a good thing to do or we, I'm going to get attacked by the environmentalists or whatever. It's because it's good business. And that's how we're going to get, we're not going to get the innovation we need unless we price things properly. Well, and you've got the Chinese, by the way, who are, being very aggressive on, on this side, in terms of the KPIs for businesses, the KPIs for mayors, and it's gonna, I think it's gonna be one of the biggest business opportunities that's out there related to carbon. One of the, the advisors on the Eco Fiscal Commission is Steve Williams, who is the CEO of Suncor, which is Canada's yeah. largest um, oil company. Um, and he stood up in an Eco Fiscal event uh, about a year ago in Calgary and said, the world needs a carbon price. And yeah. yes, it's a cost, but it's going to actually improve our business in the long run. Yeah. So when you've got people like that and Elise Allen from yeah. GE Canada saying yeah. the same thing. Yeah. Um, and pension funds yeah. that, 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 again, believe it and look at it. Um, I think that, but, but it's, we still got a long way to go. I mean, I was thinking about this actually as staying at the Fairmont, which obviously is going to get refurbished, I hope, in some particular time. And I, <laughs> But I was, think, I was sitting there I was, uh, well, this morning, not to bore you with the detail, I was shaving it in the sink. I was looking at the sink, and it's obviously been there for many, years. probably 100 years. I don't, and I, but I was just thinking, where's this going to go when it gets ripped? You know what I mean? The notion of hopefully when it's built again, we think about the circular economy. You know, I think about why you know, we should never put stuff back in the ground that we've pulled out of the ground. And I actually think there's ways of building that in and getting consumers. This is where the incentive, I think consumer power is gonna play a very big role when consumers start to say, you know what, I don't, I don't like this, but I'm not gonna pay for people that don't look at it this way. And, and, I, and I think that awareness is really rising and they're getting more demanding and they're gonna expect companies to behave and think that way. I think employees are gonna expect to work in companies that actually operate that that way. So I'm optimistic. Good. Yeah. Now, let me talk about the Growth Council. So your chairmanship of Bill Morneau's Growth Council um, comes with a bunch of pro bono work from McKinsey and from others, right? Yep. From, I think you Everyone said the BCG doing. is going to be in there. Yep. And so I hope so. We my, want everyone to join. My yeah. sense from having spent a little bit of time in Ottawa is that these advisory councils have existed before. Um, 
but they've usually not had the kind of structure that ours looks like it's going mm -hmm. to have. I don't think they've had any pro bono work from, from anybody. Um, so uh, can you tell us how that arrangement came about and yeah. why you think that's important? It, I mean, I honestly don't know how it came. It, I just got a phone call, right? It, it, and it was, uh, it was basically saying from the deputy minister, you know, would you be interested in being involved? I said, yeah. You know, first of all, when I, I get, I'm involved in a lot of work in different countries. Um, often it's in emerging markets, you know, South Korea, Malaysia, Colombia, Singapore. They're very, they actively involve business people in their economic planning it's just it's just natural if you know what i mean whereas you don't see that so much in the g7 you see it in maybe specific areas so for canada for this government to do that it re i was excited i mean that they're, that's like wow they're gonna do this and and the way it was explained uh, minister morneau said is you know i want we want ideas and we don't want to be constrained by politics so you, your job is you guys have to come up with ideas we'll decide whether we can do them or not, we may not. And that's really exciting. And I think they tapped into a chord because it, there's a lot of people that have ideas and want to be able to contribute. And, I, that, and, and so the way, I think number one is just being open is really exciting. I, that, that excites me. And secondly, there is a rigor. I mean, every one of the 14 members, everyone's doing that pro bono. And it's going to take a lot of time. You, you know, I mean, this isn't, we're not, this isn't reviewing, we have to, understand we all the good stuff. We're getting a dollar per year. We're getting a dollar a year, that's right. You might give you a dollar fifty if you deliver some things on that sort of thing. But that but it's a so so but I think again there is a and it's the notion to and again this comes from uh, Bill Morneau is you know I don't want thirty five ideas. I want four big ideas that we can use to kind of drive what what we're doing. And you know and we were we were meeting on Monday, it wasn't just Bill Morneau, there was the Minister of Innovation, the Minister of Infrastructure, the Minister of Trade, and the Labour Minister, all there for pretty well the whole day, right? So it's a whole of government. It's not, because sometimes what can happen is it can be a piece of the government, and then there's a conflicting, this is kind of like, we, he, we're all in this, we want to hear it. And, we're, and, and that excites me, and I think just the mixture of people that are on it, and, the, and having the time frame to do it, because it's, it's not, I, it's not going to be easy coming up. I don't think it's, there's a lot of good ideas already out there. It's to me more about how do we focus them and get a, an approach that's actually going to really crank up, you know, growth. And it's, it's, it's GDP per capita growth, particularly for the middle income, right? There's a strong, which I think is great because it's, it's not just growth. It's not just GDP. It's per capita GDP growth for the middle income. And I think that can be a really interesting role model for other countries because people that's not being done in other places and we need growth now we try we're at the end of the road on the quantitative easing I, th I just don't know how hard we can push the string on that one and we need something new and i think this it i think i'm, I'm very i excited. didn't anticipate I, that this conversation would get into monetary policy sorry, but i'm okay not go there yeah no i'm completely okay if it does they may not be okay there, if yeah, it does yeah but i'm completely okay yeah. with that but uh, given the focus on long-run growth, I mean, you're a perfect person, perfectly placed, given um, your business experience around different sectors, different countries, to see the kinds of things that have worked, have not worked, have been tried and failed, etc. So let me ask you for another elevator pitch. Maybe it's too early in this, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna put you on the spot anyway. What are your, even if they end up, I'm not asking you to commit to these, but yeah. what are the three Good. things <laughs> Yeah, no yeah. commitment. Okay. No commitment. Yeah. Um, what are what are three things that just strike you as very promising things we should be thinking about? Well, I can I just say, and I'm not trying to be like f political here, and but I, I think first of all we should is the there's a notion of the reality, which is that if we don't do anything, it's going to be an ugly picture. I think it's that's important to explain to all of us in Canada that it's we we've had a pretty high growth rate in the last 50 years, looking ahead, given especially the aging population, if we don't do something, it's going to be cut in half. It'll be one and a half percent at a, at a broad level. Um, and, there's, and the world's changing faster and faster. So I'm just saying the need, I think it's important we all know that. So we have to do some, I think, some significant things. Um, and if I were to pick three, and I find it hard to focus it on three right now, but I would, you know, uh, one, I think is definitely going to be around the 
about infrastructure because and it's infrastructure that drives productivity growth, not as we've talked about before, Chris, putting you know roofs on pools or it, it, this is about transportation infrastructure, rail, so make sure we can get our food goods from the middle of Canada out. It's, you know, government may not like this or not. I think it's pipelines. I'm not, you know, there, there's, it's ICT, but it's, it's infrastructure. And we have a gap of about 450 to $500 billion in infrastructure in this country. And the most amazing thing in the world is that no G7 country has done anything big on infrastructure with interest rates at the level they are. It's crazy. It's a, and so I think the opportunity to say, we're going to unlock that. We're going to get private capital to come in and earn returns. We can tap into the Japanese post, postal bank, which has two you know, trillion dollars. I mean, we're talking massive amounts of capital that would love to invest in Canada if we could structure it. So I think that's going to be a game changer. And I think we can do something pretty creative. So not creative. just doing more infrastructure, no. but the way you do more is you leverage the financial You, the private you leverage capital. private capital, yeah. global private capital, including our own pension funds, which, by the way, are investing a lot of that money outside. Right. And right. So that's got to be a, a big, you know, that I think is going to create jobs. It's going to improve the productivity of all the other activities and services that we do. I secondly think if there's going to be some sectors that we should focus on, that where there's going to be, and I know you, he looks at me funny because <laughs> economists don't like national, you know, industrial strategy, but I actually think there's some. And I, one area that I'm very excited about, there's actually two, I'm going to keep this as one bundle if I could, okay. though, is okay. in that, so the infrastructure and the second bundle is some sectors, and in that I would have, there's two. One is, um, is ag food, agriculture and food. It's going to be one of the most important industries in the future, because we, we can't just look at what the challenges are, what are the needs. We're going to have 2.2 billion new middle class consumers in the next 15 years to get, that want to eat and live like we do in an environmentally healthy way. Um, and we are one of the, we should be one of the biggest food players on the planet, and we're nowhere. We're not. And, and it is amazing. Sixty million people just in China and India every year entering the middle class. That's a, yeah, exactly. And they want to, you know, that. And this is and and so and this is going to be controversial. You know, I look at our dairy. We should have one of the biggest dairy businesses in the world, but we have supply management, which I, again, government may not like. They, they can do what they want because they may not like it. I think is crazy. It's a so we. Aquaculture, dairy, beef, soybeans, and I'm not just talking about shipping the commodity out. It's food processing. It's a high tech, you know. So I think this is one where we we got to assess it and check whether I'm on the loony fringe or not. But on it, but I think there's something big in that. I think healthcare is another one. You know, we look at healthcare as a cost as we get old, and it is. But it actually should be one of the biggest consumer markets in the world. We've got data on. We've got data like no one else has data with our system. Now, we have to think about some of the regulations and are we allowed to use that data? I think we should. Uh, but the innovation we could have around health delivery, uh, product design, um, you know, medicines, uh, therapy, I mean, we, we should, we've, we're the perfect place, I think, to, to do that, to crank it up. So that's a second kind of a bucket, if I could call it, the sector. And I, a third one, and I'm, this may change, because I have to be careful because I'm biased on this. I think this, I call it the pivot to Asia. We're, we are rightly focused on the United States because it's a huge market and we get a lot of benefit from that, but we are missing an action in Asia. I mean, so this what is do where we need to do to, we, to we need. I think we need there. a free trade agreement with China. I think we need to do it with, I don't know what will, I hope TPP will happen, who knows, with the, but we need, deeper relationships with some of the big Asian countries, China, Japan, Indonesia, India. We should be going deep. And th that's our education system. I, I would hope we should have way more Asian students in our universities in Canada. Australia's third largest export are students, if you will, you know, for a big commodity-driven uh, you know, country. And we're about a third of where they are on, on that side in terms of the numbers. So I, that's, I, I don't, that may be completely wrong, but I, those are three I would look at. I'm sure there'll be, there's innovation we're looking at, as you know, too. We're looking at, um, at how do we get the SMEs to, um, which we're very dominated by that. How can we get them more into the global markets? I think with technology, e-commerce, we could do a lot more to help them tap into the global markets because it's a, there's a new ways of getting information out to people. And that's where, again, the transportation and infrastructure will play a key role. Does that so? 
Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. We're going to uh, enter the home stretch. Um, we have talked about values and integrity yeah. in business. We've talked about the need for a long run perspective, how it's possible to have both a sustainable and a dynamic capitalism. Now, you at McKinsey are a huge employer of MBA graduates. Yeah. And so, with very high standards. Ve Is that them there? Very, that's yeah. the, that's the interview committee. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah um, that's right. <laughs> So with, with very high standards, yeah. um, so you have a pretty great perspective from which to comment on you know, what business schools, not ours specifically, but business yeah. schools in general are doing well and what they're not doing well. Yeah. So let's, let's break this into a few bits. To, to start with, what do you think business schools for the most part are doing very well? I think the functional skills are taught, you know, finance, marketing, um, you know, organization, the, they're taught, those are taught very well. And I think it's important, accounting, every, people have got to have the fundamentals, and I think that's key. I think the uh, second element is the notion of teamwork. I think there's always a notion of casework, working on problems together. I think that's just part and parcel of, a, of, a, of an MBA experience that, that, uh, that, that you see. So those are some of the, f I think, of some of the, the fundamentals. And I think also the the selection process for MBA schools is also changed, which is a benefit. You're looking for people with more experience. It, 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 I think that's much more than it used to be, much more global. And I would actually argue, say that McGill is very good uh, at that front. But because you, you see others, Harvard who is not as global as you'd think it should. And that, that you know, having students from different Nash is a very good thing. Uh, I think in the it's mix. One of the wonderful things about the McGill campus is how yeah. international the student it, body is. It's yeah. something like, I don't know what the number is these days, it's something like 21% or something yeah. that is it's from a, away, which is, it's just. Yeah. It's so I think that uh, those are some of the things that are, you know, that are fundamental and, and doing it in a fairly short order of time, if you will, right? right. Not, not taking five years, I think. So what are the kinds of things that you think we need to do better. I mean, can you give me some specific examples sure. of things we're missing the boat? I on? think, and there's some things that actually you're doing in your strategy, which I like. But this whole the data analytics. I mean, the machine learning. The this is a new, there are new ways of cracking problems, and and that, and how do you use data, which is a new, in my view, asset class. So there's a, there's a new set of functional capabilities that need to be taught. Right, that, that that are there, and it's. I'd rather it be done by the business school than us. We're doing it. We and now have. But they're not being taught in business school. Not as much. Nowhere, nowhere near as much. I mean, what we're actually having to do is we're hiring a lot of people from mathematicians. So we're going to uh, Carnegie Mellon. We're going to. There's three universities in Spain. I didn't know this. Spain has some incredibly good schools of mathematics. So we have look, big chunk of our. Our, our data analytics group are Spaniards, right? That are, it's in Madrid is where we actually have. So we're, Shenzhen in China has phenomenal data analytics. The, the schools, so there we're just trying to teach people English. The, but the raw capability building and managing massive amounts of data with the computing power and so forth, they've been doing this for, for five years now, right? And we, so that's a new, that's a new area that we, we need, and we're not getting enough. Not enough business schools are, we can't get our supply, if I could say it from that. So we're having to find it from, and that's why we have more mini MBAs now, because we're putting these mathematicians, they have to learn how, to, how we do our work um, uh, on it. So that's, from a functional point of view, an area. I think the other uh, area is actually on, I, it sounds like a very broad thing to, or, motherhood and apple pie, but it's leadership, right? And what I mean by that is, this is character in leadership, ethics. It's like great what you guys are doing on integrity and, and how we think about the multi-lens views of the world. This is why I think, you know, those business schools that are only business schools are gonna have some challenges down the road. That's why I think here at McGill, you're fortunate that you're part of a broader university, so you can work with the uh, chemists, and you can work with the physicists, and you can work with philosophers. The Syed School, look out for them at Oxford. I think it's going to be one of their biggest propositions is they're linked to a university, and they're trying, even though some of the traditional Oxford faculty, back to change, are not that keen sometimes, on do, the, the school is, and that's going to be a, a factor. Uh, Harvard is trying to let, that's going to, so I think getting this cross-sector 
view will be, will be important. Um, I think more on the experiential learning is going to be key. The internships or experience, you know, we found that to grow leaders faster in companies, you have to give them multi multiple short experiences. Doesn't mean, you don't, doesn't mean rotating people every two years, but they may be working on a, having a line role, but they're also doing something to fix the company in a particular area. And, though, and doing the combination build your leadership muscle faster. So our business schools, are they, are they equipped to make these changes? Do people in business schools, for the most part, agree with you? Are there I, blockers? I don't, are there institutional rigidities? I, I think there are blockers. You know, one thing I'll have to say, and I don't, and I'm sure, you, I know in the school you did a strategy and you had people, I'm, I'm always shocked at how few people ask me this question. And we are one of the largest buyers of funders, basically. We look at the money we spend, we finance. You know, we're financing probably, a th 1,200 students a year in business schools. That's what we're paying for, right? And I'd, I've had very few business schools come to me to say, what do you need, as opposed to, how can we get more people here? It's, inter it's interesting. I, I think, again, with the strategy effort, you've involved people. I know from our firm and other firms, so you, but it, is, it does strike me, and, and what's happening, a lot of things are happening, because we're actually, um, now having, you know, there's more and more of our people are not going to business school, they're staying in McKinsey. We keep them or we'll have them work in a different place. So if I look, take, I don't want to pick on Anna, who I work with, she's a business analyst. Um, I'm trying to encourage her to go work for the government of Togo, right, and go and help run their telecom uh, infrastructure reform, because they, they need people to go. That, that probably might be a better experience for her than going to business school, because and then we can have her go. I'm not trying to say we need business schools. There's not. It's not about that. I'm not trying to. But I'm just saying there's there's a disruption going on, and that what I and this is where I think again no one's asked me this, but I I actually think one of the biggest va values we get from business schools may not be it, the the MBA will always be a chunk. I'm not saying it won't. It'll be there. I don't think it'll be as big over time as this. But what would work is to say. When someone becomes a uh, office manager in McKinsey, I'd love to send them to executive education, actually outside McKinsey, to actually meet with people outside right. McKinsey, not for four weeks or eight weeks, and we'd pay for it. I mean, we may end up paying more for that than we... So I think there's other needs that we are going to have that um, we didn't have that business schools could have. So they need to, they need to spend more time I'm not with right. us saying, okay, what are you actually trying to do with someone over a 30-year career? And where are the moments where we could play a role? And I think there's going to be a lot more needs, but it'll be, you know, you know, after after two years, there's obviously the the MBA, but I could imagine one after you become a part. We do partner university right. now. You know, we have a we literally have, it's a week, a year because we're, there's so much new information. We can't keep our partners up to speed. And, and a bit like faculty, our, maybe our partners think they know everything that's and they We don't. We can't. And so we have to say, you've got to go to school. Faculty, we, no, they, would they never, never say they never that. Say, yeah. never so ever say that. Yeah. We, we're trying to do that. So, so I think there's actually quite a lot of opportunity, but, but it may be in some different areas. And you can see, I haven't th we haven't thought about it what enough. What fraction of the people you hire now are non-standard hires, our non-MBA? I think it's 60%. 60%, yeah. Because the whole mini MBA was created. That's right. When you started hiring, that's right. you discovered that there were lots of smart people that weren't yeah, MBAs. Yeah, that's right. And but how do we bring them, them an MBA? That's right. In we three had weeks. To, and yeah. in three weeks, you taught them, it started as four, then three, and the claim I always heard at McKinsey was that after two years of, of working, you could not basically tell whether somebody had a real MBA or some other background and a mini MBA. You could not yeah. tell the difference. Yeah, the only thing I worry about, this is about, I agree with, that's what we've we found that, because we've looked at right. progression, we study it quite in a detailed way, but the thing that I, the thing I worry about for people who don't do a graduate degree in, like they join McKinsey as an undergraduate and then stay all the way through, you miss something about, because I don't think it's just about the learning of the school, it's the, shared experiences is a chance to step back and reflect. And I've, you know, some of my friends joined when I did as, as business analysts and stayed through, and they, they regret not having gone to a graduate school. And I think one of the things an MBA does is you meet people from different backgrounds. There's the, so, I don't know how you describe it, but the social side of it, the reflection side of it. So 
That, that, we'll have to think that all of that through, but, it, but I think just like in every other, there's lots of changes, and that's why I think it's, you know, business schools need to be thinking about reviewing what they're doing on a, on a, on a regular basis, uh, like we have to. By the way, in McKinsey, right. you could ask the same thing. We, we, we don't take our own medicine. We, like, so I'm telling you, business schools should do that. We often are telling clients this, but when you actually look at us, are we changing fast enough? That, that's been a very big push in the last five years. How are we challenging our orthodoxies? Why does every problem or opportunity take a project manager plus three people three months. Why, why is that? It doesn't, it doesn't remarkably make, it's remarkably beautiful. It's remarkably, yeah, and so <laughs> there's a lot of things like that that we're, we're, but it's hard because people get wedded to orthodoxies. Right, right. Yeah. Okay, I think we're gonna leave it there. Thank you very yeah. much. We're gonna open it up to questions from the audience. Uh, I'm not quite sure how we're gonna do that. How are we gonna do that? Before uh, you ask a question, we have volunteers on both sides of the room, so please wait for the mic to arrive before you uh, ask the question. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Leon Scher. I'm an alum of the business school here at McGill. I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on Uber and Airbnb and this new sharing economy insofar as the way it's tapping latent supply and how that plays into a long-term future and how we use our resources. Yeah, I think, I think it's a fundamental change. I mean, the way <clears throat> I look at it is the, uh, how many, you know, what proportion of our capital goods are used more than 7% of the time. You think about a car, a washing machine, a house. And I think that, that this thing is going to move. I, I, just being in, uh, in East Africa last week, I was shocked. There's, there's a Uber equivalent for laundry that's just been set up in Uganda, of all places, right? You, you, I wouldn't think, you know, so, and you go, wow, that just makes it, I don't know why someone isn't doing it um, in, maybe they are, I'm not aware of it in North America, but, but I think the sharing economy is a, it obviously is a big trend, and I think it's, we've just seen the, we're, we're sort of 2%. Uh, into it, and I think one of the biggest implications, to me, what's most interesting are the second and third order effects. You know, wh obviously, what does Uber mean for the auto industry in terms of how many cars we actually need? What, what does it mean for the housing industry in terms of even with Uber, whether you build garages or you know, you think about the design of what, what we do, and you know, how many young people today actually want to own a car? How many young people today want to have a driver's license? I mean, when I was growing up, if you, you wanted a driver's license as soon as you were 16 year old by the hour you, you were in to get. Now people, my, I'm trying to convince my son to get a driver's license because I said, you'd be good if you drive. And he said, why? I said, it's just a good thing to do. It's a, it's a, yeah, whatever. I don't, so, so I think it's a big deal. And I, and I actually think it's going to have very big implications on how we think about growth, right? Do we need to have hard, white goods, hard goods, to be able to be happy and grow? What makes people happy? How do we measure GDP? I'll get, you know, what, what's, the, and, and so I just think it's, we're at the early days, and I, I think um, it's gonna have a profound effect on, on, on our resource usage. Um, it's actually like a, it's, it's a huge increase in in what an economist would call a production possibility frontier for the economy. Because for a given amount of capital, whether you're talking about a bed for Airbnb or whether you're talking about a car or a driveway, you just get more flow of goods and services out of the same capital. Yeah. So it's, it's a wonderful thing. But it's also got this very interesting uh, uh, side story that we see with Uber, right? It is going to, every once in a while, it is going to run up against an existing regulation or existing entrenched monopoly power or market power, and it's going to be um, a struggle. And right now, you're seeing Uber yeah. against taxi industries, and it is and it is perfectly understandable why the taxi drivers are upset. But it's also one of those things that it's perfectly understandable for everybody to kind of want it mm -hmm. because it's just a better thing. And so we got to figure out how to get past that those tensions. Yeah. 
Hi, my uh, name is Jeremy. I'm also an alum from McGill. My question ties in very nicely to this question. It's about automation in general and how now we see mostly in the manufacturing and industrial sector a lot of um, automation coming in and eroding the value proposition of human labor. But a lot of people neglect that in the services industry and lawyers, doctors, financial analysts will eventually see their value proposition be replaced by software that's getting, getting more intelligence, makes fewer errors, and is less expensive. Um, basically, my question is how can governments and uh, the private sector as well position themselves to also um, n not miss out on this inevitable trend of automation while also handling the societal fallout of having a large portion of the population that is rendered um, m you know, useless from what they used to do? Yeah. Well, I, I think it's going to be one of the biggest issues of our time. This is what we were talking about this in the Growth Council too, is just looking at actually how jobs are going to change. We need to look at that because, you know, if you think about an example of automation is the driverless car, right? And that, that is here now. We, we, we did a, a McKinsey sort of a, just a, we have an advisory group meeting in California about a month ago in San Francisco, and we had two people from venture capitalist firms drive up, and they both, I was shocked that they, this is how ignorant I am, they actually drove up in a driverless car. You're allowed to drive, have a driverless car from Silicon Valley to San Francisco. In the city of San Francisco, you have to drive it, right? And one of the guys who was there is they're from um, uh, uh, the, the investor in Tesla and um, in SpaceX. And he, what he basically said was 20% of jobs in the U.S. are commercial drivers, right? You think that's a big number as truck drivers, taxi drivers. I, I don't have, that's what he said, right, his number. And he said, you know, and he showed us a picture of the next generation Tesla car. Not, and not a cartoon picture, but a design picture. It has a picture of basically two couches, no steering wheel, with windows all around, right? That's the... And so what I think we have to think about is the implicate, this is coming fast, and are we, to education to me is gonna be the fundamental issue. Because I'm, I'm not a Luddite, I think that actually this stuff will create opportunities we can't even imagine, right? We don't, we, I think human creativity will, will come up with so many different new things. But the worry is the speed with which we, the time with which we have is shrinking, the speed's gone up. So what this guy basically said was, was Steve Jervitz, and he said, I, I have no doubt that those commercial drivers' children will be adapt to being able to deal with the digital world and will find jobs, but I do not think that those drivers themselves are gonna be able to reskill themselves fast enough to be able to do it because it's happening so quick. We, I think it used to take at least a generation before a disruption occurred. Now they're happening multiple times within a generation. So I think ed this education part is gonna be critical. I think the, the other worry I have is that this is we're living more and more in a winner take all economy. You know, you, the, the, there's a dominance that you wanna get very quickly. You don't, we, we talk about Uber, we, don't, we talk about Lyft, you don't really talk about any, it, it, there's a dominant um, model that occurs. And there's a lot of wealth that's created in a small number of people. Um, and that's the part we're gonna have to deal with because, um, you know, the other example is, is we, if you took to the big three employers in 1990, they were the auto players in, in the US. So you had, you had Ford, Chrysler, um, and General Motors. They had sales of about $250 billion. They hired 1.2 million people. Today, the big three companies by market cap are Apple, Facebook and Google, they have sales of about $450 billion and they employ 155,000 people, right? That's the challenge that we're gonna have to deal with. And we better face the reality, it's happening. The technology, the, the thing about technology is it doesn't really care too much about politics or even regulation, as you said. I mean, Uber, you think about it, they're on the, they didn't ask for permission. That's the most, you know, Airbnb didn't ask for, they just did it and then boom, and that's, I think we're gonna see some of that in healthcare. People, imagine you apply Uber to going to the doctor. Why do I have to, why can't I have the same thing? I mean, why not? And someone's gonna, I'm sure people are working on that now. So just one thing yeah. on, the, on the education. I think Dom's right that education is gonna be key, but it's, 
it, it's about it, it, it's about an economy that is going to be going through transitions, and these transitions are coming faster and faster. And so, what you need are we need people to recognize that, in fact, they will become obsolete here and there, and they need to make a transition, and that requires flexibility, and that requires education. Yeah. Not necessarily training in a specific thing, but education. Exactly the kind of education that universities like McGill do, including social sciences and humanities. Yeah. People that can read well, critically think, write well, uh, possibly analyze numbers. I mean, I'm, I like analyzing <laughs> numbers, but you know, it's not yep. for everybody. But, but that's the kind of, kind of flexible education yeah. so that people can actually make transitions. Yep. And I think that's going to become increasingly important. Yep. Hi, uh, I'm Eduardo Lim, uh, I'm uh, also alumnus from the uh, professional MBA program at McGill, currently working as a consultant for institutional investors, uh, mostly corporate pension plans. And I'd like to ask a question, um, and hopefully you answer using a big telescope. Um, my question is, with the uh, need to break the cycle of short-termism in, um, in, in the business world in general, um, so that um, institutional investors, like long-term capital, can um, actually uh, be free to invest in, in, in long-term um, opportunities, do we need a major overhaul in, our, um, in the field of economics uh, <coughs> so that, so oh, that uh, the... You know what's what's today considered externalities and are set aside for um, for analyzing uh, the, these problems should be incorporated back into it. I, I'm not sure whether you know uh, research is being done in the field. Whether there is a need uh, to to change the way the uh, the discipline is being taught, or if we simply don't need that much, but there are other ways to incorporate this uh, this paradigm shift. You should. Well, uh, I would say that uh, economics, um, as practiced in universities, has all kinds of problems, but I'm not sure that's one of them. Um, I'm not sure that I would blame poor governance and a short-run focus in business on their economics training. Um, I mean, I think it, it's, it's somehow more fundamental than, than what we're doing in the economics profession. But we do have lots of problems in the economics profession. I just don't think that's one of them. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, I do think, we talked about carbon, carbon pricing, right, or pollution, or I, I would even, I even think there's going to be more of a responsibility in business for, te for employees, right? I, you know, I was thinking as, Chris was talking about the flexible labor. One of my heroes right now is Randall Stevenson at AT&T, right? He is a hardcore businessman, capitalist, wants to make money, the largest single infrastructure investor in the US. He's got 260,000 employees. Because of the automation and technology changes we've been talking about, he basically said 60,000 of my people are not going to be what I need as I go forward, just given the changes that are going on. But he didn't sort of say, therefore, I'm going to fire them, which you could do. Say, so that's it, we've got to restructure, we've got to move on. He said, I'm going to give people the opportunity to retrain themselves. And he, he basically, working with Georgia Tech and Uda City, built a training program for them, not a university degree, it's just a medallion program that costs $200 for him not for the employee. And if you take the course while you work, you get a medallion, you're going to be part of that future. If you decide not to, you're gone. You're, you know, and I think that's the, that's the notion of, a, of a, a business leader taking you know, responsibility for talent more than what they need to. And I think it comes back to what that's Adam Smith, you know, if you, you uh, say this, one of his, his first book was The Theory of Moral Sentiments, which is a extremely boring book, if I might say, to read. But in it, he essentially says, I'm not quoting him right, but it's that the, it's the duty of the entrepreneur to take care of the society in which they operate, right? Do you, you, which is quite a left-wing thing in a way you could say that Adam Smith was saying, but I think it's about its ownership. 
And that's why, you know, I think we're going to have more, we're going to see more of that. Because if you don't do that, that's, you, you won't have trust. And that's why you see, by the way, with, with the short-term capitalism and less inclusiveness, you do see trust in business has been dropping for the last 30 years. In the United States, a, the only person that is lower than a CEO, particularly of a bank, but of a, a CEO, is a congressperson, which is not, it's not a great benchmark to put yourself to. So I think that we, people are going to, our, our businesses are going to be taking that into account and not doing it because it's a good thing, but because it actually helps them create more shareholder value. Okay, we have time for one more question before I believe we get to drink wine. <laughs> so, so way back there, sir, you are what stands between us and wine. No pressure. Uh, there was, thank you. Um, there was a discussion about drawing on the MBA pool and how that was uh, important and how it plays a critical role in, in building your, your pool of knowledge within uh, McKenzie. This is a learning institution. There are doctorate degrees. Maybe you could comment on how important uh, doctoral work is for McKenzie. And not necessarily in management, but in uh, natural sciences or applied sciences. Because in many, many cases, um, one can be discouraged to undertake a doctorate degree, thinking that uh, being part of faculty is the only outcome. But I, I doubt that is the only outcome. So maybe you could expand on that. Thank you. Sure. Well, we, we, I don't know what proportion of doctorates that we have. But given that 60% are non-MBAs, a lot of them are actually doctorates. So we, we are hiring a lot of medical doctors. That's what we actually have. Uh, I think we hired about 200, 200 last year, just medical doctors to come in. And many of them don't actually want to do healthcare work. <laughs> they, they want to do, but, but they, they bring a lot of different perspectives. We have a lot of uh, physicists, chemists. We have, you know, PhDs from MBA programs. Because I think what, what a doctorate, to me, the key thing about that is knowledge development. And I think having a doctorate is an extraordinarily high bar of rigor, I think, the peer review process that you have. And we'd, you'd, you'll find that most of the people in our Global Institute are doctorates, many in economics, uh, but also in natural sciences. So I think it's a, I, I think it's a very good, it's a, it's a discipline of a standard, if I could call it that. And given the need for more cross-sector thinking, well, like one of the biggest challenges we have in our change is we have about 35 sectors, right? Oil and gas, banking, you know, agriculture. You have all, and we go deep because clients expect you to be, you better be really deep in that area. You gotta speak the language, you gotta understand it. Not like when I joined where it was more a general, if you, you were more about problem solving and then you'd apply that thinking. Now it's gone, you need depth quickly. The challenge with that is a lot of these disruptions we're talking about are coming from outside your sector. Right? You know, the, the biggest competitor for Unilever in India is not Nestle, it's Vodafone. Because someone, when they're spending that extra, the equivalent of five cents, they can get more airtime or they can buy a chocolate. It's not, you know what I mean? So it's, you're, if you're a cardiac uh, specialist in New York who, who makes a lot of money doing heart transplants and so forth, the disruption that you better be most thoughtful about is the automation of, of the car because unfortunately most hearts come from car accidents, right? So you may be merrily going along thinking this is my business, it's going well, and there's a disruption going on here which is gonna, fortunately or unfortunately, depending how you look at it, cut your supply of hearts. So this, what we're looking for is people with you know, and I think more businesses are looking for people with orthogonal views. And that's why I think having, you know, being a biochemist, being a biochemist is an extraordinarily good background for doing organization design today. You, you, you think about how organizations work and how you can uh, and apply that, uh, that thinking. I always say, I learned this actually from one of our colleagues who is a, PhD, and we're worried about complexity in McKinsey. It's get, as we get bigger, we know we've got sectors, functions, geographies, 
new delivery, people going, this is, God, it's crazy. We've got to simplify the place. And I remember this guy said, you know, just quietly said, it's, it is the case that the human brain is more complex than the dog's brain. That, okay, that's probably right as I think about it. Maybe there's good complexity and bad complexity. And so I think there's a long way of saying, I think astrophysicists, we have a, we have a lot of astrophysicists that, that are, in a, and because again, their way of doing deep, thinking, I think, is more rigorous than people like me um, who are there. So I, I hope uh, we, we like doctorates. I just want to add something to this. So I've been teaching in the McKinsey, the mini MBA. I, I think I've done about 45 of them over the past 15 years. Uh, the typical one is about 50 students. I would say 80% of them are PhDs, so, freshly right. minted PhDs. So it's very often their first day or first week on the job with McKinsey. Uh, so they've come out of Stanford or Caltech or MIT or Princeton or wherever they've yeah. come from. And um, when I first started doing this, I would come home from Kitzbühel or wherever I yeah. was from doing this. And my wife, Ingrid, would say, so you know, tell me about the students that you met. And I couldn't believe the students that I was meeting. I mean, th this was, I have never been in a room with more you know, over-educated, over-achieving, pumped up, high-octane people in my life. And they're just really, really impressive. And they are PhDs in everything under the sun, including you know, biochemistry, but there's religious studies, yeah. there's law, Poetry. there's history. Yeah. And you put them all together over the case, I only see them over three days, and then I go and somebody else does finance. Uh, but you see them come together in these case studies, and they're all contributing, and they're all, they're, they're all coming with their own outside perspective, and, but they're all super smart. So this is the unpaid pitch for McKinsey. Very nice. I Here it is. Any more questions for him? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay yeah. People. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So it turns out that I'm the guy who stands with you and the free booze. Uh, <laughs> just a couple of uh, words of thanks. Thank you for our student volunteers um, for for making this happen. Thank you for. Adam Halpert and, and Megan Poss, where is Megan? Megan is there. For all the heavy lifting that went into the design of this event, as well as the, the other events that we've done. Uh, and obviously, thank you, Christopher. Thank you, Dominic, for a thrill ride. Uh, we know that you get a dollar's um, salary <laughs> for the, the Growth Council, and you know that it's university... It's not even a US dollar, it's a Canadian. Yeah. Okay, the university salaries we know are great, so what we can offer is a really fancy McGill mug. Oh, so, yeah. Uh, so that is going to be your payment, so thank you so much. <clears throat> so which one is this one? Thank you. Thank you, sir. You did well. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much.